Hello everyone, thanks for joining us for another one of our uh, series on the Lord's statements concerning entrance into the Kingdom of Heaven. Uh, our next statement comes from Luke, the ninth chapter. Uh, Luke chapter 9, and we'll back up to get a little bit of the context, so let's start reading in verse 57. We're told that as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. To yet another said, uh, yet another said I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those back at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So, uh, as with some of the statements that we have looked at in this series, uh, not all of them are, we might say, worded in a positive way. That is, these are the things you have to do to enter the kingdom. That is, some of them are stated from the negative standpoint. These are things that you cannot do if you are going to enter the kingdom. And we have one of those examples there. Now, uh, the reason why this whole context is so important is because all these statements and these ideas are connected. There's kind of a, a common theme here, and that is one of uh, commitment. But that commitment is described in the context of sacrifices, uh, things that can't come first, things that have to be given, uh, that have to be pushed to the back seat to make way for the most important so what are some of the things that the Lord says may have to be sacrificed? Well, the first person comes along to the Lord and says, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, all right, if you want to follow me, that's a good thing. But it's going to mean that you may not have a place to sleep. Now, if we're going to follow Christ, does that mean for sure that we're not going to have houses and beds? No, that's not what that means. What it means is that our commitment to Christ is going to have to take precedence over conveniences even of something as we would say as fundamental as a house and a bed. Um, did Jesus, when he began his ministry, never sleep in a house or sleep in a bed? Well, no, he did. Um, although he didn't always. Um, he didn't have his own house, his own bed. Um, would Christians who came later on, or even uh, followers of his then, did they have houses and beds? Yes, a lot of them did. The Lord's point is that if we are going to follow him, there are things that cannot take precedence over our commitment to him. Um, and those, those even include things as fundamental as what we would say are the basic needs of life. Now, what I think is important to note is that um, according to the Lord's own definition of what we need from uh, Matthew chapter 6 there, um, the, the basic needs for humanity, he actually doesn't include a house or a bed to sleep in. He includes uh, food and he in includes clothing. It doesn't actually include a house. Um, it's theoretically possible to uh, live without any kind of shelter. It's not very comfortable, but it is possible. Well, again, the Lord isn't saying we have to, but it has. It needs to be a commitment that we are willing to make. The next one said, uh, well, this next one, the Lord says, follow me. He initiates it. But the man says, well, first let me go bury my father. The Lord's response is very interesting. He says, let the dead bury their own dead. They might say, hold on a second. This is not a zombie movie. People who are dead don't bury other people. Well, that's true. The Lord is not saying that we're going to wait for the zombies to do it. Um, and is he partially making a bit of an overstatement here? Yes. The Lord at times would say things that were purposely kind of ridiculous and absurd. And he's using that absurdity to make his point. It's hyperbole. We, we use the same kind of statements today. In fact, a lot of them we use without even thinking about it. Um, say that, um, you know, I was literally starving to death. No, you weren't literally starving to death. You were just hungry. Or this is literally the best cheeseburger in the world. Probably not. Even if it was, you'd have no way of, of, of proving it. But we use hyperbole all the time. The Lord did too. But it seems that the Lord actually might have had more in mind than just that. Let the dead bury their own dead. 
See, death is used in two ways throughout Scripture, spiritually and physically. You, everybody is going to physically die, at least basically everybody. Um, but there is another way that death is commonly used, and that is spiritually dead. That is those who, yes, they are physically alive, but because they don't have that relationship with God in the next life, they will be sentenced to eternal death. And so they are viewed then presently as spiritually dead. Now you might say, well, are we saying then that taking care of the dead is something that Christians aren't supposed to do, the physical dead? Well, again, see, that, that seems kind of weird. Are we saying that Christians can't bury their own loved ones who are also members of the church? That, that seems weird. Well, that's not really what the Lord is talking about either. Rather, what he's saying is you need to leave the affairs of this world to those to whom the world belongs. Leave the affairs of worldly things to people who are of the world. Yes, we live in the world, but as Christians, we are not of the world. Our citizenship is in heaven. He says you need to be willing to cut ties with worldly things and focus on spiritual things instead. And that might mean giving up things that seem pretty important. Things that maybe even mean a lot to us. The man says, I want to go bury... Um, my own father. You say, well, I mean, that, that seems like a pretty responsible thing to do. It is. It's certainly not a bad thing by any means. Uh, the point is, is that we need to be willing to say, there's nothing in this world that is more important to me than following Jesus. Um, and that's easy to say, and it's a lot harder to do. The third one, though, I think is where it gets really, really hard. Because the next one says, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus, no, Jesus doesn't directly say, no, you can't go say goodbye. He says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. He doesn't directly say, don't go home and say goodbye. But he gives the man a stern warning. And this is where we get to see all these principles tied together for us. That all, the things that the Lord mentions here, these are not all inherently wrong. The problem is, is that all of these things have a way of dragging us away from our commitment to Christ. And the Lord's point there, when he gets to the end of this paragraph, uh, in Luke's account here, the paragraph, is that if we say we're going to follow Jesus, we put our hands to the plow, as it were, and we look back, that, that commitment falters. The Lord says we are not fit for the kingdom. And that is a pretty intense statement right there. Right. What I, What's really uh, interesting with, uh, or what jump, kind of jumps out with me with these three different instances, because there's three different things that this, mm -hmm. he ultimately says this disciple is willing to you know, follow Jesus. And of course, everyone is, uh, when we decide you know, I want Jesus in my life. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to have that relationship with him. Uh, but if you notice here, you know, one kind of one kind of builds on another, and one seems to mm. almost get more intense uh, and progresses, you know, to, to be more significant in our personal life. What I mean by that is when you look at the first one, you know, Jesus, you know, as when we start looking from verse 57, he says it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. What a great statement that is. I mean, that is mm -hmm. a that is a mind that is conscious that where, you know, that has the motivation to want that relationship, something that they don't have yet. Mm -hmm. And but Jesus, you know, it almost like is like Jesus starts to test him with, mm -hmm. you know, OK, if you really want this, here's what you have to do. Whereas, you know, the flip side of that was someone saying, okay, I want you in my life. This person says, I want, you know, I, Lord, I want to follow you mm. wherever you go. And yeah. Jesus said, okay, here's the first thing. Um, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he's talking about, you know, there are tangibles in our life that when we decide that I want that relationship, that I want to repent and be baptized and added to the kingdom of God, which are necessary for salvation, mm -hmm. uh, there are things that, you know, there are tangibles in our life that we're going to have to give up. Mm -hmm. There are things that, you know, something that I might have that might be holding me back that uh, sort of define me the way the world accepts and defines what my life are. 
uh, tangibles or you know conveniences or uh, or carnal items in my life that mm -hmm. would cease me to being an effective disciple uh, or cause me not to be able to be a, a, an effective disciple. Yeah. And you get to the second one. Okay, well, you know, a lot of people can say, okay, I'm going to give this up. No longer am I going to do that. I know it's going to be difficult, but I can give, you know, whatever it is might be up. If it's, you know, if, if it's, you know, if it's alcohol, I'm going to give that up. If it's, uh, you know, a, you know, if, if it's something that, you know, pornography is a big one that, you know, mm. someone's going to have to give that up. It's something that the world openly accepts, but I've got to give that up. And that's, you know, it's something carnal. It has to, it might make me yeah. feel certain ways, but it's still ultimately just carnal. But then you get to the second one and he says, okay, Lord, let me first go bury my father. Well, that's something that he's doing. That is an action that is taking place right mm. there. So not only is Jesus saying, okay, I want you to give up, you know, these carnal things, I want you to give up what is occupying your time and I want you to follow me because our, our devotion to Christ, you know, that can I not focus on anything? Absolutely not. Jesus was not saying, I don't want you to not worry about your family and, you know, and have that kind of an attachment to them. Mm -hmm. But he's saying, look, you're get, you've got to give up this thing that is, you know, going to pull you away from the work that's going to be at hand. And that's why he tells him, he says, you know, let the, the dead bury their own dead. But then he gives a, a, you know, a, an extra statement here. He says, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. That is what was at the crux of this. You know, you want to follow Christ, preaching the kingdom of God is, a, is going to be the major thing with that. And, right. you know, not just as, you know, first it, I need to get myself right with him, but then I'm expected to go and preach him to other people and not just sit on it and dormantly and... Mm -hmm. not doing anything so he's saying okay you need to give this up to follow me and then the person says well uh, i you know this disciple says well I, I need to go bury my father it's something that is occupying his time and jesus said let you know that's going to take care of itself right your job is to preach the kingdom of god that's an action mm -hmm. and finally when we get to this third one it's probably as you mentioned the toughest one of all i can you know, I can organize my time. I can learn to prioritize and manage my time to say, okay, this is going to fall into second place, or this is going to fall, this is not going to be the priority on how I occupy my time as much as wanting to read the scriptures, as wanting to live faithfully to him, as, you know, as, as what Jesus says, preaching to other people, evangelizing mm -hmm. to them. And that's an action word. But this third one is so, so difficult because having a relationship with someone else is one, I think sometimes the biggest hindrance, whereas we don't, it doesn't start that way. The intentions certainly aren't that way uh, when you, you know, begin that. But, you know, he says, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house because he has a close relationship. I'm guessing to say, okay, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back and I'm going to do this. Jesus knows that there, you know, relationships have a great influence on us whether they're yeah. for good or for bad, mm -hmm. you know, people are going to be that strongest influence on them. I can give something up because it's just me. It's a personal struggle with me. Yeah. But when I have someone else that comes into the picture, you know, Jesus said, look, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And what he's saying, he didn't say, you know, cut off all ties, but he says, if you go back and that person's going to be, is going to stand in the way of your relationship with me, mm. That, you know, we can't look back. That relationship, because for one thing, if I have that that strong relationship with Christ, every everything else is going to kind of fall into place. Everything else is going to, um, you know, when we look at this, the whole thing, you know, it's almost like a triangle. And I do this for when I do mar premarital counseling as well. And I know a lot of preachers will probably use this, and you probably have too. Uh, you know, if you're to draw a triangle, and uh, each point, you know, you point out that, you know, there's God and then each of the other points is, you know, the man and the woman. Well, at the furthest point, they're furthest from each other. But as you move towards God, you're moving further, closer to one another. Mm -hmm. As you're moving closer to one another, you know, God is that center of attention. And when you hit that, and, and that's, that's the whole foundation of a relationship right there. If I can make sure that I prioritize God in my, in my life, everything else is going to fall into place. But it does mm -hmm. get stronger and stronger. God said, Okay, you've got to take these things out of your life. You've got to take this time 
a way or you know when to prioritize your time and then you've got to learn to prioritize your relationships to make sure i am first in your life absolutely and i think there's a, a an important idea that kind of connects with that idea of this being uh, a relationship speaking of our relationship with god um and that is that i think sometimes we have this idea um that our relationship with God, and, and sometimes this, this idea connects to any relationships, even, even physical relationships, that they are based on um, that emotional connection right. that we have with that person, with God. It might be based on, with, re with regards to our relationship with God, we might think of that those emotional, uh, that emotional response we had when we were baptized. We might think about an emotional high that we had uh, after some lesson, after uh, maybe going up to Bible camp or something like that, we right. have those those moments where we're on. We we might say that that mountaintop experience, and and I mean those are those are good feelings. And and sometimes we think, well, that is the foundation of my relationship with God. And so we're always trying to chase that. But the problem is, in any relationship, it's not just true with God; it's true with other people as well. That emotional response. Uh, that emotional response or, or reaction that can't be the foundation of the relationship. Otherwise, there's no solidity to that relationship. There's, right. there's no concrete foundation. It, it's, it's fickle. It's, it's based entirely on our whims. Um, what the Lord is asking for here is not a relationship based on a feeling or an emotional response. He's asking for a commitment. If you put your hand to the plow, don't look back. Right. Are there going to be times where we don't feel as close to God? Yes. Are there times where we're not going to be having that mountaintop experience? Well, yeah. I mean, the reason why they're called emotional highs is because they're not the norm. They're temporary. If, if we were always on an emotional high, it wouldn't be an emotional high anymore. It'd just be a plateau. It, it loses its power when right. it's normal. Um, it's supposed to be temporary. Um, what the Lord is saying is our relationship with him needs to be based on our commitment. And on one hand, that's very exacting. That, that sounds more, it, it sounds like it, it requires so much more work because it's not going to always just come natural. Like, oh, well, I, when I feel this way, of course I'm going to act uh, in accordance with his will. I, I feel great about it. That's easy. However, in another sense, I think it's actually incredibly reassuring that we can go through times where we don't feel as connected to God or as close to God. We don't feel that same joy. We don't feel the same happiness. And that's, that's actually perfectly natural, that it's a commitment. The, the basis of our relationship is a commitment. And that shouldn't surprise us because... When God talks about his love for us, agape love, it is not an emotional reaction. Agape love is a decision to seek the best for another person. Right. And so that's what the Lord is asking for. He's asking for our commitment to him. That doesn't mean that it's always going to feel the same. It won't. We shouldn't expect it to. What he is asking for, though, is that even when we don't feel the same way, even if we don't have that emotional high at the moment, that we keep our hands on the plow. Uh, and that, uh, I think, is, is vital for us to keep in mind. One, so that we don't allow all these other things to distract us. But also, I think, again, it's important for us to keep in mind to let us know that when we're in that situation where we're not on that emotional high, that doesn't mean we've drifted away from God. It, yes, you might not feel that same emotional high that you felt when you were at Bible camp, when you were in the midst of that great singing, when you came out of the waters of baptism. Okay, you might not feel that, and that's okay. That's natural. That doesn't mean your relationship with God has fizzled. Uh, it, it means that you're to the work part. You're to the uh, grab the plow and start working part. Right. This is a, uh, you know, as we... Look at this, and we get you know, t towards the end of uh, this discussion. You know, you look at each one of these things, and you know, I've heard people say, "Well, these are just talking about excuses, and why would that?" And while that is an important that that is important tangent to bring into this uh, kind of a discussion, that we can't use 
excuses to say, okay, well, I've just got this to worry about, and I've got this, and I just can't worry about, you know, I don't uh -huh. have God uh, first, and I do these other things, and, and that is important, but, you know, you look at each one of these, though, and, and it's not necessarily that he was talking about excuses. He's not, you know, because he said right up, he said, you know, Lord, I, w I will follow you wherever you go, and so Jesus said, okay, are you willing to give this up? You know, are you willing to live this way? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, uh, you know, and then he says, follow me, and he said, Lord, you know, let me go and bury my father. He wasn't using that necessarily as an excuse. Mm -hmm. It was something that was obviously important to him and important enough for him to do. Uh, and it doesn't even, you know, we don't even have have it on record. I think that's, you know, we're making an assumption when you say, well, he was just using his to bury his father as an excuse to not follow. No, because he already said he wanted to follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus said, follow me. And he said, well, I've got this to do and I've got this to do. That's one thing, but he, you know, he starts this whole part out right here, this whole discussion with the Christ by saying, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. That's a proactive statement right there. That is mm -hmm. a, you know, a great motivation to sit for someone to say. All Jesus is saying right here when he says, you know, let the dead bury their dead, when he says, okay, I want my father. Well, what about my family? What, you know, what if I talk mm -hmm. to them and, you know, tell them that, I, and Jesus says, well, you can't, you know, you can't go back. There are certain relationships that we have in life that we're not going to be able to have anymore if we were to have that relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it is our own family. Our family, you know, they have a great uh, influence. They have a, a great pull on our lives. And, and we have to be willing to, uh, you know, put certain relationships, even as much as we might love someone, uh, there are some relationships that are just toxic and we just need to make sure I don't want to associate with this person again. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't look like that's what he's talking about right here. He's saying, I want to go tell yeah. my family that I'm going. He loves his family enough to say, okay, I'm following you. you know. And, and Jesus says, you've got to you know, prioritize your time right here with mm -hmm. me and with the work that is at hand. So, Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, our, I think our, our primary takeaway here has been from this section is if we want to be in the kingdom of heaven, if we want to be considered a follower of Christ, um, it's, it's going to take a commitment. And there's nothing then, the Lord says here, that is valuable enough on this earth, whether it be uh, our basic needs, whether it be um, responsibilities from an earthly perspective, or even our relationships, that's worth giving up a commitment to Christ. Nothing on this earth is valuable enough to give up that commitment. Right. Uh, but I think we'll go ahead and close there for this video and uh, appreciate you uh, tuning in and we'll be back with more later on. Great. Thank you.